Welcome to There's a Better Way. I'm Anna Morris, Associate Director for Executive Education Degree Programs at Fisher College of Business. Many of our students in executive education are at a point in their career where they're making a transition, whether that's a transition of roles or a transition of industry. Today, we're discussing the transition between industries, specifically from industry to healthcare, and how our three guests, Matt Stuckey, Nanette Richardson, and Derek Flynn, have been able to successfully translate their operational excellence skills from one industry to another. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So let's start off the conversation by giving you a chance to tell us a little bit about you and your background. You want me to go first? Yeah, you can go first. <laughs> so I'm Nanette. I um, have an industrial engineering degree and started my career at General Motors as a student and then was hired on at the end of that. Worked for them until I had my first son, and back in the day when I worked for General Motors, if they wanted me to have a son, they would have issued him to me with my gate pass. So they were pretty inflexible about flex time. And so I decided to be a stay-at-home mom. I uh, ran a home-based business and then um, came back into process improvement in healthcare in 2008, started at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and got here about five years ago. Great, Matt? Yeah, so I uh, also have an industrial engineering degree, um, and it was industrial and systems engineering here at Ohio State. Um, so I didn't think I was going to go that route. I started in mechanical engineering, but when the equations had things that started moving in them, I said, okay, maybe I need to find a different route here, um, and kind of learned that ISE was the business engineering, um, so it felt perfect for me. So after undergrad, I worked at Rogue Fitness for two years, so um, based here in Columbus. I was an industrial engineering or industrial engineer for them. Uh, doing facility planning, capacity studies, things like that. Uh, promoted to a supervisor on the shop floor. Uh, so ran the CNC machining department, so manufacturing and assembly of the barbells, which was awesome. Uh, long hours, but uh, good experience. Uh, I switched to a Honda supplier for about two years, so Tiger Poly Manufacturing, uh, located in Grove City. Um, did standard operating procedures, work cell design, you know, typical industrial engineering things. Uh, and came to Ohio State uh, the fall of 2016. Um, so the management engineering team at Ohio State gave me a shot and I've been here ever since. I moved to the James uh, Operations Improvement Team in 2018 though. Great, and Derek? Yeah, so I have a little bit different uh, background. Uh, my bachelor's degree was actually in political science um, and I did Army ROTC while I was in college um, and did five years as an infantry officer in the Army. and. Kind of towards the end of my time in the Army, I was exposed to Lean and Six Sigma and uh, had the opportunity to get exposed to the MBOE program, um, and that's what brought me up here to Columbus. So while I was doing the MBOE program here at Fisher, um, I was working at the company that owns Value City Furniture, uh, working at their corporate office, um, doing Lean initiatives, and then about 10 months ago, I had the opportunity to join the James Operations Improvement Team. Um, so I've been here ever since. So. Great. So we'll get to it in a minute in terms of what that transition may have looked like for all three of you and how you were able to make that transition. But first, can you explain, you know, the team that you're on currently? You're all part of the James Process Improvement Team. Um, can you talk a little bit about that team and, you know, kind of the makeup of that team? So we are, the Process Improvement Engineers are one of three branches in the Operations Improvement Department. So we report up to um, Sarah Stevenson, who reports to Chris Kipp, and he is the Executive Director for Clinical Services. So there's um, seven of us who are engineers, and um, one person who's the Business Ops Coordinator, and then we have a branch for James Instructional Design. Um, they know a lot about learning, about education modules, um, and they're really helpful to us and to the organization. And then the newest branch is project management. So a lot of our process engineering projects used to be very project management oriented. And so with this new branch of, we have three project managers and one open position for them. So we've grown tremendously in just the five years that I've been here. Great, and it's a very behind the scenes team. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people when they think of healthcare, you know, they, they go to the nurses, the physicians, the people who check you in. Can you just tell me briefly, like, wh why is your team so important? Obviously, I, I know why it's important, but can you talk about the, the true importance of what your work is really geared towards? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is that we uh, are helping the clinicians in their day to day. Uh, the clinicians are super busy helping the patients 
in their day to day, and that day to day is extremely stressful, and you know it's nerve wracking experience being in the hospital. Uh, so we are helping them kind of have those light bulb moments of oh, there's a better way to do this, right? And that was not planned at all. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that we're just helping them see that just because it's done one way today doesn't mean that has to be the same, you know, as they move forward, helping the patients. And so for us, it's we're helping them help the patients. So we're helping the patients, um, you know, the goal with the goal of eradicating cancer. So, yeah. but indirectly, which yeah. puts us behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, you know, like limiting wait times in the in the waiting rooms, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, recovery times. You're looking at all of the ways that you can improve those processes that then impact patient care. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so now moving to kind of the transition. When you were in industry, were you ever thinking, oh my goodness, I can take the skills I'm doing in the manufacturing or the process improvement in the manufacturing or in, in industry, excuse me, and translate that into patient care? Is that something that was on your mind or is that something you, you came to know as you were kind of looking at your career path? I think I can kick this off. Yeah. I think being in the MBOE program, I was exposed to a lot of varying um, industries and a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses. So I started to see, hey, this can work in finance, this can work in healthcare, this can work in anywhere I want to go. It's just a way of thinking. It's a way of attacking problems and it's not specific to industry or, or any specific um, workplace. And so. Um, I started to get that almost immediately after starting the MBOE program was like, man, I could really make a difference with this in a place that isn't focused as much on dollars and cents, but more focused on patient care. Um, so yeah, that, it was really beneficial for me to be surrounded by those people. Had I not been, I probably wouldn't have seen outside of my, where I was working at the time. Yeah, and to clarify, the MBOE stands for what Masters of Business and Operational Excellence. And that program, along with our other executive graduate degree program, our executive MBA, we really find students who are coming into these programs Mm -hmm. at a point in their career where they've been successful, they could continue to be successful, but they're looking at perhaps a transition Mm -hmm. or maybe a pivot, whether it's changing focus areas within their company, whether it's changing from finance to more strategic level um, or changing industries, which is what you three have done uh, here. Um, so let's talk about that transition. What made you want to make that change from industry to healthcare? <laughs> um, so because I took such a sabbatical off to be a stay-at-home mom and teach and have a home-based business, um, my first real experience with healthcare was always on the patient side of things, and. Um, I had several experiences with one of my sons at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And while it was wonderful and um, one, of, one of the best patient cares that I could have, I was always sitting back thinking, I wonder how they, I wonder how they improve what they do or I wonder how they maintain this culture. And so um, when I started to look for a job in the industry, um, I thought to myself, it was the first time for me that something like service or healthcare could be an option. Um, I started my career a lot, a number of years earlier than Matt and Derek have. And so then it was not heard of in healthcare and it really wasn't heard of in the service industry. So it's been a, a progression in the United States. Yeah, I think for me it was, I've always been interested in the healthcare side of things, but kind of the same thing of, on the patient side, um, mm-hmm. unfortunately, for a, a few things. And it's like, man, this is a really cool operation, but never thought that what I did as an industrial engineer would apply to healthcare, but um, saw this the posting for the Med Center on LinkedIn and just said, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do. Uh, making widgets every day, you know, as cool as it is. Uh, just didn't really get it done for me. So finding the why um, really was the reason that I was said, you know, I, I want to put all my efforts into getting this job at the, at the med center. Um, and anytime you're feeling a little down or a little, you know, oh, man, these projects are bogging me down, just walk through the hospital <laughs> in about five minutes. Uh, the motivation and, and, the, and all of that comes, you know, right back. So um, I do have a funny story about uh, my first interview for the med center job. I really went to the Gemba a week beforehand. Uh, Can I you was, explain what that means? Yeah, so going to the Gemba is the, the place where the work is done, um, and it's a Japanese term, so a lot of 
what we do is still derived from the Toyota way and, and all of that stuff. So uh, it was about two weeks before I think my interview was scheduled and I was riding my bike, just trying to get a workout in, uh, involved in an accident, um, concussion, four hours of not remembering my life, which is terrifying. Uh, and apparently I ended up in the emergency department. And so I show up to this interview with just a gnarly wound on my head and just like, I really tried to see what the work was like uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, here I am, and I still got the job. So I don't know if going to the Gemba is um, the reason why, but um, that's a very unique way to do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would not recommend it at all. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you guys are very passionate about kind of moving into from industry to that mission-based work at the mm-hmm. James. Um, I'm sure it also had some challenges, right? I mean, process improvement can, can translate well, but there's still very different things from manufacturing and industry over to healthcare. Can you talk about some of those obstacles when you were making that transition? And maybe Derek, the MBOE program hopefully helped prepare you for some of those obstacles? Yeah, I think from a, probably the largest obstacle is just the language, acronyms, um, knowing what is the right data to pull. Um, I've even had situations where I'll use a term like provider and it's not used correctly and I'm quickly corrected um, <laughs> by those on my team. But um, I think that that language is very difficult um, and not having a clinical background, there's a learning curve whenever you enter a project and something that's unique for us is each project we go on to is a new, it doesn't build on the last one necessarily. You go from um, one project to one that's completely different and so you have to, you have to really put the time in to learn that. I think the MBOE program, I could have learned the Six Sigma, the lean, the technical skill set anywhere. That that was not specific to Fisher. What Fisher offered me, though, was the ability to learn how to have conversations, how to have critical conversations, how to approach a project without making someone feel like they're being blamed for that problem um, was unique to Fisher. And, and that's really helped to, to get over some of these obstacles is going in really just as like a servant leader and saying, I'm here to help. I'm not here to blame. I think you're working really hard. Um, and I don't think you come to work every day trying to do a bad job. But the reality is, is that we have a gap and I want to help you fix it so that that stress level comes off of you. Um, so if I hadn't gone through the MBOE program, I don't know if I would have been able to remove myself from the military type approach I had been taught of, you know, this is a problem and you're the problem and, and, and kind of how they treat you in that world. So I'm um, very grateful for that. Great. And how about Nanette and Matt, kind of what were those approaches that you took as you were, you had that learning curve and you were trying to make that transition smooth? Um, I think for me, it was, yes, the, the process is very different and the, the vision that clinicians have, whether they're nurses or physicians, is very different from what I see of how to connect the dots. So they know their start and end for their process, but they don't really understand how whomever provides them something affects their job and whatever they provide to someone else affects that job. And then it affects the whole process overall. So it was um, having conversations to help them connect the dots of what's outside of their control. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest, I guess, obstacle initially was similar to Derek, the language, the acronyms. I would, a lot of my notes were, you know, acronym, Google, (laughs) reminding myself to look that up. Um, But on that same note was sort of assuming that I would just understand it if I learned what that acronym is. And that's not the case. So um, learning how to ask questions the right way in these projects and in the work um, was a a big lesson. And also similar to what Derek said is, working on the skill of empathy because these are people coming to work to help other people they're not people coming to work to cash a paycheck they're not just hating skating they're you know, coming in to help uh, and so learning the empathy that hey i'm taking time out of your day but to make your life better right um, was a big key and actually for me uh, learning the skill of leadership and it's something i didn't do the MBO, mboe program uh, but i did get my mba from ohio state and taking all the leadership classes and learning how to get a group of multidisciplinary folks kind of pointing the same direction uh, and then getting to, you know, the destination was a huge skill that I learned, so. 
That's great. And I mean, I'm sure you guys have also been under immense pressure the past couple of years with some of these external stressors that weren't a part of the healthcare previously. Um, and so being able to navigate those crucial conversations and how you approach problems and how you approach the, the work um, is extremely important. So we've talked broadly about the type of work that you do. Can we talk kind of more specific? What projects have you implemented or are working on currently um, in order to help that patient care improve? You want me to start? Sure. <laughs> um, so a significant number of my projects are in the ORs, in the operating rooms. Um, and the biggest focus thus far has been getting the instruments, equipment, and supplies to the correct OR at the correct time and have them be of high quality and accurate. So. Um, working with preference cards, which are kind of like the recipe cards for a, for a procedure um, that list everything that's needed and then helps the nurse and the staff with setup of the OR. Um, and now the real focus is on how to communicate with central sterile supply to make sure that the instrument sets that come up are correct and that they're set up correctly and that they've been sterilized um, sufficiently. And I'm sure doing that in an efficient way then helps with, you know, delays for absolutely. patient, you know, procedures and making sure that the ORs run on time. Yes, absolutely. And so it all kind of rolls together. And to um, Matt's point, it I'm trying to help them see that if they complete the communication to Central Sterile Supply and let them know what their expectations are, then what they receive from Central Sterile Supply will be will meet their expectations and they can meet all the metrics that they have to meet. And what type of check-ins are you having? I know you mentioned before we started that you were you were in the OR this morning with the <laughs> OR team early this morning. What type of check-ins do you have as you're working to implement this this process? Um, we're, we're working on a dashboard that'll, sh well, two things. The way that they're going to communicate with Central Sterile Supply is that they have iPads and a check-in procedure that lets them know, lets central sterile supply know this was the OR and this was the procedure and this was our issue and they can even take a picture of the issue because a picture is worth a thousand words and then it gets sent directly to central sterile supply who can use it for coaching moments but also for data so that I can go back and let them know okay this is how well you're doing on reporting issues um, the good thing is that once they started using it, they also wanted to report what was good. So they weren't trying to always show the bad. They want to begin to report also to say, hey, this was great, and take a picture of it and show them why it was great. And you're able to provide them instant feedback instead mm -hmm. of seeing that there's a problem and having to remember that a few hours later when you exactly. finally sit down at a computer and, and send that information. Exactly. That's great. Matt? Yeah, a lot of my work... Um, is around the care continuum and that is such a broad term um, and it really is a broad area um, but it really literally spans from inpatient so when you come into the hospital to when you leave but then getting you to your outpatient appointment um, in a timely manner things like that so um, a big project that I've been working on is reducing our unplanned readmission rate uh, so if a patient leaves the hospital you're discharging them freeing up a bed for someone else that needs it but then they come back within 30 days is the metric we look at um, and they didn't need to, that's uh, bottlenecking the system, right? And so working through the throughput in the hospital, but then also preventing that unplanned readmission um, is a huge project that I've worked on. And uh, there's multiple ways that we've kind of attempted to mitigate that uh, unplanned re readmission rate. And it starts from the moment you walk into the door. So you get that bed in the inpatient setting, we can start prepping you so that you don't have to come back. Um, and that's the care team, but it's also, you leave the hospital, you have a post-inpatient post, uh, discharge appointment seven days later, but five days later, you're trying to read through your AVS and... What's AVS? Uh, uh, after visit summary. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> <the acronyms. laughs> they make sense to me now. Uh, and you can't find the information you need, you can't find the phone number to call, because you were stressed about the inpatient stay, right? Uh, maybe you can't, you, you don't remember, you can't find it, and then they come back. And it's... Most of them are preventable. We, we could have done something about this. Uh, so we're adding work onto our plate for no reason, and uh, the patients are now even more stressed because they're back in the hospital. Um, so we've implemented a few things. Uh, so a lot of things are still in our pilot phase, so I won't in, uh, indulge too much in them, but uh, some things I think are really gonna help 
not just improve a metric, but improve the quality of patient care that the James provides. And that's been uh, fun to work on. So, Yeah, obviously you want patients to be able to come to you for care, but if they can stay home and stay comfortable and, and stay well, that, that's your ultimate goal. Yep, exactly. And especially during COVID when you know, visitor restrictions were, you know, you couldn't come in and help your loved one. When then they get out of the hospital and they might not remember all of the information they were told, you are trying to read through an AVS that is unclear. It's medical terminology, right? It's sure. difficult to understand. Uh, how can we how can we improve that? And that it's brainstorming. It's novel concepts. It's what are the best practices? Let's do all of it, right? That's great. And Derek? Yeah. So I have got a lot of projects that are kind of all over the place, just being new to the team. Um, but most of mine is focused on flow of. Uh, whether it's information, whether it's um, product. So I'm working on a project um, with a colleague of ours in nutrition services, um, trying to get our meal delivery service um, sped up and, and a little bit more accurate on the on the turnaround time. Um, I'm working on a project um, to try to help reduce um, C. diff infections um, within the hospital. Um, but then, you know, all the way over at the Stephanie Spielman Breast Center, I'm working on a project there to try to help with um, last minute appointments that get added on that throw off the schedule and, and impact uh, multiple patients throughout the day. And so um, I've had the opportunity to kind of learn the James that way um, by getting projects in a couple of different areas. So what I'm hearing is you are everywhere. Mm-hmm. You, yeah, yes. I mean, mm-hmm. from meals to after they're discharged to OR, your mm-hmm. team really reaches everywhere within the James. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure patients don't necessarily know that until they listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> so no, they thank you <laughs> for, for your work because it definitely has an impact on their care. Um, can you tell me what's the most valuable thing about the work that you do? I think for me, still being new, I don't think I quite understood from an empathy standpoint, um, working on nutrition and, and maybe arriving to a patient's room and the meal's late and the patient has been waiting to eat because they need to go to a procedure. And, and just looking in there and kind of imagining, you know, if this was a family member of mine, right, how would I feel at this moment? Um, I think that has been the most valuable thing is seeing that, um, you know, I came from industry, it's really just dollars and cents, it's a product it's a customer, you try to make it as best as possible, but here it's someone's life, someone's family that's relying on the James to take care of this patient. Um, and so being able to contribute back to that has been incredibly valuable. Great. Um, I think for me, it's it's that piece, mm-hmm. helping the patient have the best experience on one end. But the other end is when I'm working with a team of clinicians or or a multi-functional team, it might even be registration and billing all together. Um, and as they're working through the process, coming up with ideas, and they have that aha moment of, oh, I thought this was gonna be more work, but it's really not gonna be. It's mm-hmm. gonna be helpful in the end. So that's, that's a lot of it as well. Great. I think it's the relationships. So relation, relationship-based care is how we operate at the James. So it's care for patient, care for self, care for colleague, um, all of those things. And when you get into a project, you do start caring a lot uh, about your team. You, you know, say you're doing an observation in a clinic, you see the same patients maybe once a week, uh, you start caring for them, right? And it's, so it's relationships you build with your project team, um, the patients themselves, coworkers, right? We're having issues and we come together as a team and we talk about it and how, do, how can we help each other? Um, so I think it's it's those relationships because like Derek said, you know, on the industry side, it's I had my team at Rogue, but you know that was it. And mm-hmm. hey, if if something was late to us, it wasn't our fault. It was someone else's fault, and it was easy. It was like the who can point the biggest finger. And now it's hey, it, who can help each other the best, right? And that's just the cohesive environment. I think is uh, the most valuable working for the James. I mean, the passion that you guys have makes me want to join your team. <laughs> so <laughs> if there's no <laughs> No, so it sounds like, you know, there's great things that industry has to offer, right? And there's mm-hmm. there's wonderful things that are happening in those industries and manufacturing. But it sounds like you three have found your better way of using that process improvement that you've learned um, to kind of guide that mission-based work that it sounds is very valuable to you as individuals. Yeah, absolutely. So, so was yeah, that transition, despite the obstacles and all the acronyms, was it worth it? Last question. 
Yeah, absolutely. From my end, I mean, especially what Matt was referencing with our team. I mean, our team is a group. I've never met a group of people that have no egos and are. I can go to them on anything. What do you think about this? Am I looking at this the right way? And there's that help. And and even within the James, it's the same way. I can go to somebody that's been on a prior project and say, "Hey, can you help me?" And I've never had that level of collaboration in my career so far. So absolutely, it's been a great move. Yeah, I think so too. I tell people um, frequently. So I told you that I started in healthcare later in my career and after a very diverse career. And I packed four hospital experiences into a very short time. Nationwide Children's Hospital, a couple of community hospitals, and now the James. And I tell people that I've landed where I'm supposed to land. Yeah, and I mean, of, of course, it's been uh, worth it, I think, for two reasons. One, uh, healthcare, helping people. It's just sort of my passion. That's kind of what um, I like to do is help people and lead. And two, it's Ohio State. <laughs> it's like my dream to work for Ohio State. And I thought I'd be like a you know, 65-year-old professor that got one shot. And here, you know, in my 20s working for Ohio State, this is my dream. This is awesome. Well, thank you for the conversation, and I know we're working with your team to collaborate with our Masters of Business Operational Excellence program to see how maybe they can get involved in, ty- in your type of work and understand what's happening behind um, closed doors at the James. So thank you so much for joining us. It was, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. For more episodes or information about executive education program offerings, please visit fisher.osu.edu.